I have some exciting news for you. I've been working hard to create something just for you, and it's officially live. It's a free quiz to help you determine your personal path to creating a successful digital course. That means by taking just two minutes to complete this quiz, you'll discover my three proven approaches for creating a profitable digital course, and you'll find out which one you should take based on your experience, expertise, and where you're at as an entrepreneur. Not only will you find out what path is best for you, I'll even give you a step-by-step framework for bringing your digital course to life. So head on over to amyporterfield.com forward slash quiz right now to find out your next steps to creating a profitable business that you love. I mean it. Go take the quiz right now. Don't wait one more second. amyporterfield.com forward slash quiz. Your future business and digital course is waiting for you to take this first step. I cannot wait to see what you create. So amyporterfield.com forward slash quiz to get started creating your stellar and profitable digital course. All right, let's jump into today's episode. When you send a message in a pitch, when you send a message, there's only one objective of sending a message. And that objective is to get someone to return your message. That's it. You should not be leaving a full pitch of credibility, emotional attachments, quantifying reasons, impacts, and capability. Too many people are selling on a message, even in person, in an initial conversation. It's just to get their interest, right? To stimulate interest with the pitch. So then you can transition interest and share the vision. A pitch's purpose, the perfect pitch, is to stimulate interest. In order to transition interest and share a vision, you're going to have to use collateral material, answer questions, do a variety of different things. But that initial perfect pitch has one goal, and that's to stimulate interest so they ask for more. Or an initial pitch may be just to get the pitch, meaning get them to call you back, to ask you back, to email you back, to DM you back, to LinkedIn you back, whatever it might be. We have to realize the sole purpose of that type of pitch is just to get you to come back. I'm Amy Porterfield, ex-corporate girl turned CEO of a multi-million dollar business. But it wasn't all that long ago that I lacked the confidence, money, and time to focus on growing my small but mighty business. Fast forward past many failed attempts and lessons learned, and you'll see the business I have today, one that changes lives and gives me more freedom than I ever thought possible, one that used to only exist as a daydream. I created the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast to give you simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies to help you do the same. If you're an ambitious entrepreneur or one in the making who's looking to create a business that makes an impact and helps you create a life you love, you're in the right place. Let's get started. What if I told you that you could statistically increase your chances of selling your product or service, even if you're just starting out or you've been struggling with selling? Well, today I have five proven steps to help you do just that. Basically, today's episode is a step-by-step for fast-tracking you from struggling with selling your product to selling like a pro, all by perfecting your pitch. Now, I couldn't talk about pitching without inviting the pitch expert of all experts on the show, and his name is David Meltzer. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this guy, and I say just a little because if I were to list all of his phenomenal achievements, we'd be here a while. David is the co-founder of Sports One Marketing, Hobie was very impressed with that, by the way, and formerly served as CEO of the renowned Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency. His life's mission is to empower over 1 billion people to be happy. I mean, this is a really good mission, right? Now, his mission has led him on an incredible journey to provide unparalleled value through his content and communication, and you'll see what I mean in this episode. David is also an expert when it comes to crafting a pitch that sells, and today he's sharing his five to thrive for creating the absolute perfect pitch. These are five tangible steps you need to implement into your pitch to make it actually sell and to make an impact. And yes, if you're listening to this, that pitch may just well be on a webinar. 
And one thing I love to do is I love to learn from people that are having success in different areas. And I want them to tell me how they get that success. And then I apply it to my own business for my own unique way of doing business. And that's exactly what we're going to do here today. Here's what I want to do with this episode. Listen to the steps and then stick around until the very end because I'm going to jump back on solo after the interview and I'm putting these steps into actionable steps that will work for you as an online entrepreneur or more specifically as a digital course creator. And by sticking around until the end, you'll also get to hear David's absolute number one tip for selling and building a successful business and is really good. So I won't make you wait any longer. Let's bring on David. Welcome to the show, David. I am so thrilled to be back with you again, and I can't wait for you to share your knowledge with my audience. So before we get started, though, will you give everyone a brief intro, just a little bit about your background? Because I think they're going to find what you've got to share very interesting. Oh, I hope so. I uh, have an eclectic background background. Uh, involving two currencies. One is the currency of money because I just wanted to be rich to buy my mom a house and a car. And the other is a currency of faith, uh, which blends in that, which I came to the awareness of later in my career in my thirties, but uh, started out w- with uh, six kids, single mom in Ohio, just wanting to buy her a house and a car because only time I wasn't happy was when there was financial stresses, not enough money, food, something broke down, summer camp. Uh, my mom had a saying, doctor, lawyer, or failure. I was the only sibling that didn't follow that. I wanted to be a professional football player, but very swiftly, (laughs) (laughs) very swiftly, I realized as I got ran over my first play in college uh, and laid on my back and decided doctor, lawyer, failure, tried to be a doctor. I was pre-med. And then my oldest brother, who was a doctor, gave me the best piece of advice. He said, be more interested than interesting when I told him I hated hospitals. And so I changed my entire trajectory of my life to start asking questions and learning about things instead of just completely being driven by how much money I could make. Uh, Although I did go to law school uh, through that interest, uh, was going to be an oil and gas litigator. One of the advantages of wanting money is that it always kept your options open because most people limit their point of entry. They limit their vision. They limit their ass. They limit themselves. When you only want to make money, one of the advantages looking back is that I was always keeping my options open to how I could make more money. And because of that strategy, I got offered a sales job out of law school besides a litigation job. Uh, The sales job was in 1992 to sell legal research on the internet. And uh, at the time, my mom literally said to me, I better be a lawyer because the internet was a fad and I destroy (laughs) everything I'd worked for if I go through the internet. Uh, oh man! <laughs> second lesson of that journey is just because someone loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. Yes. Those are two great things I learned. Anyway, I took the sales job, nine months out of law school, millionaire, branded myself an internet guru. We sold that company for $3.4 billion in 95. Wow. Went to the Silicon Valley, learned how to raise money. So I raised hundreds of millions of dollars and ended up the CEO at 30 of the world's first smartphone with Microsoft and Samsung. It was called the PCE phone. And I thought I had everything. I went from living in a world of not enough where I was a victim. Everything happened to me and why me to this world of uh, just enough for me. I had everything for me. I was buying things I didn't need. I was buying more things I didn't need, different things I didn't need. But more importantly, I was buying things to impress people I probably didn't even like. But yet, Money had always bought me happiness and and love. And uh, I ended up becoming an investor, an entrepreneur. I met Lee Steinberg and and became the CEO of the most notable sports agency in the world, Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. And in that experience, surrounding myself with celebrities, athletes, entertainers, billionaires, millionaires, entrepreneurs themselves, uh, in my dream job, for the first time, I wasn't happy. And... Uh, I, through 2006, started realizing that I was lost through help of my wife, who made it very clear that I was lost. And in 2008, I lost everything, uh, over $100 million while I was CEO of Lee Steinberg. And in 2010, I started a sports marketing company with Hall of Fame quarterback Warren Moon with a different trajectory, not just to give so I could get 
no more trade negotiations, not living in the world of just for me. But that was really from 2010 on, I've really lived in a world of abundance of more than enough to make a lot of money, to be comfortable receiving, to help a lot of people and have a lot of fun with my life. And I've reestablished and gained everything through this paradigm shift. And uh, last three years, I've built my own brand. As you know, I have two TV shows, Elevator Pitch, The Two Minute Drill, which has been picked up by Bloomberg and multiple other places around the world. Now I do coaching and speaking. I've written four books that are bestsellers. And my main mission is to empower over a billion people to be happy using my platform. And most importantly, the dummy tax that I've paid. I can't pay your state or federal tax, but I can save you a lot more money. I can pay your dummy tax if you hang on here for the next 25 minutes or so. I love it. Tell me this really quickly. There's a lot of entrepreneurs listening. And I think one of the fears that many entrepreneurs have is, what if I lose it all? And you just said you are someone who did. What was the one thought you kept thinking through all of that that you think got you to where you are today? Radical humility. I think that question is asked in so many different ways from what would you tell your 18-year-old self, your 28-year-old self? What's your greatest lesson of losing everything, of making millions? To me, it's radical humility. And in the context of humility really lies one thing, and that is that you need to ask for help. You need to find people in the situation that you want to be in. The easiest way to get to where you want to be is find somewhere that's there and ask them for directions. And that, no matter what, I know our egos get in our way, but that's the ultimate lesson that I've learned is how do I deal with my own humility and learn to practice ending fear and to use my free will to clear the interference and corrosion, separation, the void shortages and obstacles that I create myself because I'm already living in a world of abundance, not only connected to everything, but also connected through everyone and them through me. Wow. That's powerful. I appreciate you sharing that. Okay. So you're here to talk about pitches because nobody makes pitches like you. And I want us to talk about using pitches the right way in your business. And this is really important because I know a lot of my listeners and entrepreneurs are terrified to make a pitch, but I want to help them understand that in order to make an impact, you've got to sell. And selling starts with this pitch. So you've got these five areas to focus on within a pitch to make it perfect, feel natural, genuine, and sell. And so I feel like I literally am going to get a fast track lesson here. I don't usually take notes during podcasts. I'm like, bring it on. I'm a student here as well. So can you start from the top and work our way down to all five? Absolutely. And these five things are a continual practice. You need to learn to enjoy these five things consistently every day, persistently without quit in the pursuit of your own potential. Remember, pitching is just like a sport is just like a a science. You know, you're born with a quantum ability. So you want to not compare yourself to anyone else. You want to find your own frequency and practice that consistent, persistent pursuit of your own potential. And the first thing applies directly to that. And it's the most important thing you can do in a pitch. And that's credibility. You need to go through your pitch, whether it's a one minute in an elevator pitch, like on my TV show, Elevator Pitch, or a two minute pitch, like on Two Minute Drill, or a five minute or a five hour pitch. Whatever it is, you better go through your entire pitch with a fine tooth comb of credibility. Because where most people lose a pitch is that they oversell, they back end sell, they lie, manipulate, or cheat in their pitch. They don't mean to. They have good intentions, but they sway the truth. And the minute you open that energy, people start looking with skepticism at everything that you say, and it slows down the process and it decreases your statistical success. So you need to understand credibility and be as close to the truth as possible. That also means that you have to illuminate your weaknesses. People will respect and gain credibility when you illuminate the problems, the challenges, your failures. You need to illuminate the truth. And if you do so, remember, most people don't consider, they usually consider features and benefits when they're pitching. They don't consider the most important thing, which is credibility. There's a mathematical equation to credibility. If you're a hundred percent credible, People will do exactly what you say. In fact, if I was 100% credible on this podcast, I could tell everyone, hey, wire me a million dollars. I'll give you two million by the end of the week. And everybody would do so if I was 100% credible. 
Now, I've never reached that potential, but I work and practice to it every single day. And the more that you practice, the more clarity you get, the more balance, weighted balance of your values, the more focused you are. And remember, it's not what you say. It's what people hear. Lou Holtz, the coach of Notre Dame, used to say that all the time about his football teams. It's not what I say. It's what they hear. Credibility is what they hear. You may think you're saying something, but if you lose credibility, you're saying something completely different. So please go through everything, practice, enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of your truth and the credibility that comes along with it. The second thing that you want to do is get an emotional attachment. I told you the lesson in my background of being more interested than interesting and having an emotional attachment. People buy on emotions for a logical reason. People buy on emotion. And what we don't do a lot of times when we're pitching is do enough research to find out what people like and what they don't like. We don't do enough research. We're not more interested than interesting to find out what they're doing today and what they like about that and what they don't like about it. We don't do enough research or interest to find how do I make myself equal and then allow myself to appreciate the difference. Appreciate means add value to the difference, not create a separation, void, shortage, and obstacle by creating attacking thoughts or judgments or conditions upon the differences in some comparison that sucks the energy, the emotions out of it but instead gain the emotion, gain the attachment because people buy on emotion for logical reasons. The best example of this is when I was young, I dreamed about having a Ferrari because I thought that everyone in the world would love me, respect me. I thought girls would want to go out with me. I thought <laughs> guys would want to do business with me. Everybody would love me because I had a Ferrari. What I found out when I got my Ferrari and I justified it, by the way, with emotions, right? With lots of, of course. Reasons. I said it was a great investment that I could do more business. People would respect me. Well, what happened was when I bought the Ferrari, not only was it a bad investment because the more I drove it, the more it broke down. If I didn't drive it enough, it broke down. It was the most expensive car in the world to fix. But beyond that, you know, people did not respect me. They became jealous and hated me because of my car. I was more worried about my car than my own health. And all of these things, and even worse, I think it just revealed to the girls that I dated what my true anatomy was and my ego of being a narcissist and an idiot. <laughs> um, and, and I do that to illuminate for credibility. But that is a classic example of buying on emotion for logical reasons. We want to make sure that we're credible and we emotionally attach. Now, the third thing is very important because it's the first thing that we need to quantify. Uh, quantifiable value is so important because a lot of people cannot transition from the emotional attachment that they receive, the credibility that they've given into a quantifiable value. What happens is when you get someone that is emotionally attached, you sometimes lose credibility because you work in the world of the purple dinosaur. And everybody knows my favorite cartoon character is Barney, my big purple dinosaur friend. And, you know, when we pitch the purple dinosaur pitches, we're working on subjective value. We're only relying on the emotions and the credibility of the past in which we've articulated. And so what happens is during the pitch, I love you, you love me, nobody makes any money. And in the <laughs> end, unfortunately, when we're pitching, uh, in the end, the truth always comes out. The truth vibrates the fastest and always comes out. And in the end, there's going to be this unbelievable question of, Am I going to invest or I'm going to do what you're asking me to do? And usually there's a quantifiable evaluation that occurs beyond the emotions because emotions run out, right? What we like, and that's why, you know, some people that sell on emotions and features and benefits, they have to have a very quick close. They have to take advantage and, and make their ask very fast because it doesn't wear well. And we all know that type of business doesn't thrive. So learn how to quantify the reasons why somebody's going to do it. Talk about real numbers. Talk about credible numbers. Don't use vague numbers like, well, our revenue has increased 300% this year. Well, when someone says their revenue is created, you know, increased 300%, it to me 
lessens the credibility because I automatically go to, oh, I bet they made $3 last year. Now they've made $9 because if they actually had any revenue, he would have added in there, we've made $3 million this year, which is 300% more than we made last year. Oh, great point. Okay. A lot of people won't quantify things. And the more we leave void shortages and obstacles, the more we create interference and corrosion between us and the truth, the less statistical chance we have of having a successful pitch. So learn to quantify the reasons. Don't just feature and benefit dump onto people. Now, the fourth one is to quantify the impact. Now, the impact is also an emotional aspect, but impact has usually huge long-term numbers that are equated with them. When we can impact our environment, we can now transition an emotional uh, safety feeling that we have to make sure that we have fresh air to breathe and clean water to drink. But there's an economic impact, a quantifiable impact that that has by allowing people to drink fresh water or to breathe clean air. And so make sure that we're quantifying the impact, not just utilizing it as an emotional tool in which to effectuate the pitch and to get alignment, synergy, or supplementary value to it. We want to talk about real quantifiable numbers of impact. This is saves time. This saves resources. This saves actual dollars. And look for the impacts of where it has either gain losses or savings according to the impact that your uh, solution service or product has. Then finally, what we utilize, and this is something especially keen in COVID, is capabilities. Capabilities are three things that you need to quantify. The first is the skills uh, that your product service or solution has. And how does that equate to quantifiable value? So the first capability we talk about is here's the skill set that it has or the service that I have or solution. And then the second is knowledge. A lot of people ignore when they quantify this, the capabilities of their company, solution, service, or product. They do not include knowledge as part of the capability. Knowledge is a duality. And in that duality, the first part of knowledge is uh, what you know, like what exactly it knows. So if it's AI oriented, if it's a time saving efficiency, what does it actually know? The product service solution or you. And then two, who, right? Included in everything else is who is involved and quantify that number of people that are involved. You know, we want to make sure that we use realistic numbers. Uh, when we're doing things, you know, some of the biggest turnoffs when people are quantifying their, we're the next Google, we're the next Uber, we're the next, no, no, quantify the numbers, quantify the reasons, impacts, and especially the knowledge that you have, both of the what and the who, and combine those together. And then finally, most importantly to me in a pitch is the last capability, and that's desire. Within the context of any pitch is your own desire. And there's a common denominator uh, that I look for in every pitch, and that's the desire that you must be what you can be. Looking for a product solution service or person or entrepreneur who's pitching me that has a desire to be their higher self, that realizes that they're happy where they're at, they know they're in the right place at the perfect time, but they're angling towards something better using their credibility, emotional attachment, reasons, impacts, and their capabilities aforementioned. But they have faith that they're going to end up somewhere better than that. People will invest in a B product solution or service with an A player. And the final determination of an A player is their desire. Every great business person and personality knows that we evolve and that the number one reason that people do not achieve what they're presenting or do not achieve the success or objective that they have is that 99% of all people on earth quit before they're 25% of the way there. Another 99% of that 1% quit before they're 50% of the way there. And it's that 1% of the 1% that have a desire that they must be what they can be. And not only 
are able to display it, but they can articulate it in their credibility with the emotional attachment, the ability to quantify the reasons, quantify the impacts, and quantify the skills and knowledge in those capabilities. This aspect of desire is a very difficult thing to quantify. But if you can, if you can, and I, I've had pitches from people and I, I stop listening because all I think to myself is, I'm investing in this person because nothing's going to stop her. My favorite entrepreneur ever was on my TV show, Elevator Pitch. And uh, she was an entrepreneur that already had two exits. She was only 32 years old. But when she was 18 years old, she adopted two children and her parents kicked her out of the house. But she knew that that's what she must do to find her higher self. And there was a 12 and 11 year old little boys that she adopted at 18 because she felt it was the right thing to do. She had two exits already. I knew no matter what product solution or service she was talking about, that she would make it happen because she was able to quantify to me this unbelievable thing called desire and that higher self that's involved. And within this pitch comes the ability to practice. And how, how do how do we do that? Now, a lot of people realize there's four ways that we practice. One is in person, one is on the phone, one is via email, believe it or not, and then one is via media. And you need to realize that a pitch occurs in all four of these mediums. It occurs in person, less than it used to today. It incurs on the phone. I think the biggest uh, piece of advice that I can give to people is to be tough and use a telephone in your pitch. Uh, it's a lost art. If you don't believe me, go look at how many voice messages you have on your phone compared to text messages, emails, DMs, etc. They're not even close. If you want to get someone's attention, then you should use the telephone to pitch them. Because your voice has a vibration and it has a frequency. It can create intonation, connotation, intonation, uh, and intention. Where so many people are using text messages, DMs, emails to pitch people. Uh, you know, I'll tell you so many times, nobody buys on a message. Nobody buys on a message. There's only, when you send a message in a pitch, when you send a message, there's only one objective of sending a message. And that objective is to get someone to return your message. That's it. You should not be leaving a full pitch of credibility, emotional attachments, quantifying reasons, impacts, and capability. Too many people are selling on a message, even in person, in an initial uh, conversation. It's just to get their interest, right? To stimulate interest with the pitch. So then you can transition interest and share the vision. A pitch's purpose, the perfect pitch, is to stimulate interest. In order to transition interest and share a vision, you're going to have to use collateral material, answer questions, do a variety of different things. But that initial perfect pitch has one goal, and that's to stimulate interest so they ask for more. Or an initial pitch may be just to get the pitch, meaning get them to call you back, to ask you back, to email you back, to DM you back, to LinkedIn you back, whatever it might be. We have to realize the sole purpose of that type of pitch is just to get you to come back. Now, here's another thing to practice in the context of pitching. When we call someone or ask them in person, there's only two things that can happen. One, the person is available for the pitch, or two, you need to leave a message. We already know the only purpose of leaving a message is to have someone call you back. But the other side is, we have to be prepared and practice if somebody says, yeah, I'd be interested right off the bat. They actually answer the request in person or on the phone or via email or uh, via media. And so we have to practice all four mediums and get to choose which one of those mediums we may be best or most statistically successful at performing at and being able to do these five different things of a perfect pitch. But if you can create credibility with a fine-tooth comb, if you can know that you have the emotional attachment that people will buy on emotion for logical reasons and give them those logical reasons based off quantifiable value, not Barney purple dinosaur value, but quantifiable reasons, impacts, and capabilities, which includes not only your skills, not only your knowledge, but most importantly, 
be able to illustrate and communicate your desire, you will have statistical success, efficiency, and effectiveness in every pitch, and you will attract via that frequency, more and more people with open minds. Remember, we are seeking people with open minds. Sometimes we are, I said it earlier, limiting ourselves so much that we're looking for that. You know, I love when people tell me, I'm looking for a strategic investor. I always tell them, well, you're looking for an open-minded investor and you should have two categories of investment, one for people that you don't want to involve strategically and one that you do. But your objective of raising money is to raise money regardless of whether the person is strategic or not. And so we need to find people with open minds and not limit ourselves because it takes as much energy to pitch someone with a closed mind as it does a thousand people with an open mind. So we want to make sure that we are asking the right people and sending out the right frequency for those pitches with people with open mind. I appreciate the opportunity to share these five perfect pitch tips, and I'm happy to ask any further questions, Amy. So good. Thank you so much. Wow, that was like power packed and you are one of the best communicators I've ever had on the show. So, wow. I do have one quick question for you. And that is you've talked about the triple A before alignment, action, adjustment. And I really want my listeners to hear about this. Can you dive into that real quick? Yeah. And it stems from the advice my brother gave me that be more interested than interesting. There's a joke in in sales that 80 80% is collecting, right? 20% is selling, 80% is collecting. The same thing's true with the AAA strategy. 80% of your time should be getting alignment, being more interested than interesting, finding the open mind, seeing where the emotional attachment would be, being and being able to illuminate and align synergistically and supplementary with what value you can provide. 80% of your time should be spent getting alignment and then take action. And while you're taking action, it's kind of like that philosophy, like I said, be happy where you're at, at the right place at the perfect time, angle to what you want, but have faith that you'll end up somewhere better. The only thing that I know as I get older and older is I don't know what I don't know, part of being radically humble. So I prepare in my alignment for adjustment. I am prepared to adjust. I'm not going and being happy where I'm at right now and going straight to what I want. I'm angling towards what I want with alignment and adjustment in mind. So 80% of your time should be spent being more interested than interesting to get alignment. Then the law of Goya applies, which means get off your ass and take action. Nothing happens until you move. Go study Einstein if you don't believe that. Amen. (laughs) And then while that action, a subset of action or activity for me is to have radical humility and prepare for adjustment And the best place to prepare for adjustment, like we said earlier as well, is to find great mentors. You know, find someone that's already where you want to be and ask them for directions. I'm going to repeat that, everyone. The big lesson, the big takeaway, find someone who is where you want to be and ask them for directions. It's the fastest, easiest way to get there. It's the dummy tax that you don't have to pay. Forget federal and state taxes. I know our politicians are going to argue that for the next 26 days. Just think about the dummy tax of what you would have gained if you didn't make those mistakes by just simply asking someone that is where you want to be, how to get there. Ah, such a great way to end this episode. Thank you for that. I want 100% wholeheartedly agree. So thank you, David, for being here. And tell my listeners where they can find more about you. Well, as you know, my mission in life is to empower over a billion people to be happy. Happiness is the greatest virus of all. It's spread by witnessing it, by listening to this. You'll be happy and it will spread to other people. And happiness strengthens us emotionally, physically, mentally, financially. It even strengthens our immune system. So it'll protect us against other viruses that may damage us. So I do free trainings every Friday. The replays are featured on Spotify. My playbook is featured on Entrepreneur. On every platform, you can have free trainings on how to be happy, how to make more money, help more people, and have more fun. And the easiest way to do it is to simply directly email me, david at dmeltzer.com, or join my text community, 949-298-2905, or just Google 
David Meltzer at David Meltzer, LinkedIn, YouTube. David Meltzer is the way to find me best. And I appreciate the opportunity. If any of you want to be one of my 1,000, a thousand times a thousand, a million, a million times a thousand, a billion, we can create a collective consciousness, change the world, impact the entire world by being happy. So please join me every Friday or watch the replays on Spotify, Entrepreneur, or any of your favorite platforms. Thank you, David, so very much. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. What a pleasure. All right, my friend. That was really good, right? But I want to break down these steps into tangible actions that will work for you specifically. So for the first one, credibility. This means to use stories and experiences in your webinar, in your emails, in any other content that you're creating, but especially in your webinar, because that's really where you'll be pitching. You can use stories from your journey, and if you have them, from your students' journeys as well. The second one, emotion. This means that you should speak to your audience's wants and needs. So get really clear on their wants and needs and talk about those in your emails, on social, and on your webinar. The third one, quantify. This means that you've got to use numbers to further support your audience's emotional connection. That means that when you're sharing stories, Give actual numbers when it's appropriate. For example, you can share how your process has helped others increase their followers or subscribers by XYZ numbers and give them the exact number or percentages. So for example, let's say that you are a social media manager and you created a digital course to teach others how to use social media. When you're telling your success stories, Talk about how you've helped them grow their followers by X number, like actually give specifics when it's appropriate so it makes it more real. Also, just share details as much as you can to bring it to life. Now, fourth, impact. This means that you have to share clearly about your pathway and how it's going to offer them more or less of something. For example, the Digital Course Academy roadmap in my program. I offer it in my Digital Course Academy course. It helps my students to save time and frustration in creating and launching their digital course. I give them a roadmap. And when I'm marketing the course, I talk about this roadmap. I show a picture of this roadmap so they know exactly how I'm going to help them and how I'm going to take away the stress and give them more clarity. That's how I'm going to make an impact to get them results. Number five is capability. This is where you want to share your 10% edge, why you are the person who should be teaching what you're teaching. And this is where you talk about your experience. So paint the picture for your audience of why you're the one to guide them to their desired want or need. This also means that you show up with confidence. When you're confident and can show your audience that you are the one to guide them on this desired journey, they will be more likely to want to follow you and purchase what you're selling. I think that also comes out in how you show up online, how you show up on video, the strength of your voice. And this is all stuff that you practice over time. You're not going to nail that first webinar with total confidence, but the more you do, you will, my friend. Remember, there is no room for imposter syndrome here. You are exactly where you're meant to be. You are the person who should be teaching what you're teaching, and you remind yourself of that every single day. I want you to take these strategies that David shared with you today and use them to improve and perfect your webinar pitch. I challenge you to keep coming back to these steps and add them to your webinar checklist. Keep practicing them. Keep thinking about them. In fact, you might need to listen to this episode one more time. David talks fast and he had a lot to say. I actually listened to it twice so that I could create this ending for you and make it really actionable. And the second time I listened to it, I got so much more out of it because at the end of the day, You want your pitch to feel natural and genuine and easy to do because that's how you make an impact and reach the people who really need what you have to offer. So when you listen to it the first time or second time, keep asking yourself, how do I show up as my authentic, vulnerable self when I'm selling so that I connect with my audience in the deepest way? If you thought this week's episode was good, keep on coming back because you know I'll be here every Thursday delivering top-notch step-by-step episodes to help you grow your online business and create a successful digital course. Thanks for joining us today. See you next week, same time, same place. Bye for now.